Okay, so, so let's start. Oh. Uh, so, uh, okay, a few things to start with. Uh, one thing, I have to remember to finish a few minutes earlier because I want to give you some uh, feedback forms to, to complete. It's going to take you just about five minutes. Uh, projects. So, uh, Yesterday I heard that some people asked questions. I did talk about it last week. Do start work, uh, your work on the project. Don't wait uh, until you get uh, comments. We'll try to give you the comments this week, hopefully tomorrow. But uh, even if you didn't get uh, feedback, you should, uh, you should have started working. If not, start today. In two weeks, I'd like to see uh, some intermediate project uh, report, sort of progress report, and then you'll have one more month uh, to complete it. Midterms. So um, most of you probably saw it on Piazza. So here are some statistics. Uh, so we cover the whole scale, which is good, I guess. Uh, uh, Someone didn't forget to put their ID. Uh, and the median and the mean are about the same, 58, which is not so bad, a little bit uh, lower than I was hoping for. But uh, basically, it looks uh, pretty good. So if you wanted to see distribution differences between undergrads and grads, as I said at the beginning, there is a quite a, a significant difference, about 10 uh, points. Um, so uh, you can kind of place yourself accordingly. Here is the histogram of the grades, uh, which looks, you know, okay. Of course, I'd like a few more of the people here to move here, but that's the way it came out. So basically, you know, people that did 80 and above, uh, kind of in this group of 75 and above, I think did really, really well. Uh, people that did here didn't do so well. Um, and uh, I can show you distribution per, uh, per question, but basically the, the solutions are going to be out today. Please look at it. Hopefully uh, you'll understand what you did and you didn't or didn't do well um, and learn from it. Um, okay, here are again two distributions for grads and undergrads. Both of them look okay shifted a bit, um, so, um, but you can see that people got very good scores, both as un undergrads and as grads, so, uh, okay, this is the question distribution. Uh, they were not equal the same, so uh, this was out of 30, the short questions, the decision tree was out of 20, and the other two was out of 25. Um, again, you can look at it again once you see your exam and uh, ask questions. Questions now? No questions. Okay, if you do have questions, the exams are going to be in my assistant's office uh, after class. You can go and pick it up, pick up only your own. Uh, if you do have questions or you want three grades, please send me email with this title. I put it also on Piazza. Uh, I will only look at emails with this title because it's going to go to a, a, a folder. So please try to use this. And, and also let me know which questions uh, and what problems you have. So don't just tell me. You know, we want to regrade, but rather uh, explain why and in watch questions. Uh, questions? Okay, so, so let's move on then. Uh, so, so what we've done so far is, is essentially uh, learning that I can call here error-driven learning. Uh, and we're going to move today to something that is not necessarily error-driven, although we'll argue that in, in almost all practical uh, 
perspective, it is error-driven. But um, here is the protocol of learning that we looked at before. We looked at uh, a distribution D over space X cross Y, where X is the instance space, Y is the set of labels, for example, plus or minus one. Uh, we could think about a process that generates the data for us, the examples, where there is some distribution, D, that is unknown to us, that generates the instances X, and then there is some other process, a labeling process, that governs the generation of the labels, and we can say that this is the distribution of Y given X. So overall, there is some joint probability distribution over X cross Y that is written this way. Uh, now, we, we can, this is a very, very general procedure. We can think about it both in the case where there is some function F that labels the X's, and the function is this D of Y given X, or some noisy cases or just a distributional case. So, so this is a very general setting. Of course, if D is known, there's no learning, right? We basically can just predict we're going to do, we're going to say that Y is the argmax of D of Y given X over all possibilities of Y, and it's only two possibilities uh, in this case. So we are interested in the case, or we were interested in the case where we don't know D. Uh, and specifically, if we're looking for a function rather than a, a prediction, Again, we can use the same kind of protocol where we simply find the one that maximizes or minimizes the probability of mislabeling, and this is how we denote it. So, so the chosen hypothesis is the one that is going to uh, do the best in terms of, say, here, misclassification error. Okay, so, uh, so we want to learn this distribution. And we can think about it really in two basic approaches. One of them, which we actually devoted most of the semester to, is discriminative learning. I'm going to call it here direct learning. And the second one, which we're going to start talking about today, is a Bayesian learning approach or a generative learning approach. Uh, just as a running example for the next few slides, to see the differences, let's, let's take text correction as our example. So here is a sentence. Uh, it has a typo, and I want to figure out that this it probably should be replaced to the word in. So I want to, I want a model that learns from data and is able to, to make this correction. So in the direct learning protocol, really we're going to model this problem as a problem of learning from examples. We're going to observe a lot of examples, positive and negative examples, for it and for in, in this case. We're going to discover some regularities from this data, and these regularities are going to give us a way to, to come up with some prediction policy, when to say it and when to say in. Very direct thing. For example, the policy or a function that we're going to learn uh, will say, we'll, we'll have this it or in rule. One of the components of this rule could be if you see the word the before your target word, make the target word be in. This is a pretty good rule. Maybe it doesn't have enough coverage, so you want additional. But this could be a component of your predictor. So this is basically what we've done throughout the semester. I mean, here I'm presenting it as a rule, but it doesn't necessarily have to be written in such a simple way. It could be part of a general function that is a member in our hypothesis class. And all the assumptions that we're going to make on our learning process, we're going to fold them really into this hypothesis class. What are we, what functions are we learning? So the bottom line is that we are learning in this paradigm a function, h from x to y. Really, we're estimating the probability of y given x, where y, in our case, is a label, it or in, given the instance. That's what we've done. We have another option. Oh, and, and in fact, some details on what we've done is really the way we did it is we took a sample, we defined some loss function, how we measure our losses, and relative to this loss function that I'm writing here over all the data, right, weighted, each example has its own weight under the distribution D, and I'm weighting the loss function of H relative to the real label Y, 
and I'm adding some regularization terms. And we, we talked about several different uh, possible loss functions throughout the semester. In fact, we didn't really talk about this one, but we're going to talk about it uh, probably on Thursday. And once we do this, uh, we know that we have some guarantees, right? So if we find an algorithm that is capable of minimizing the loss on the observed data, we know learning theory guarantees that we're going to do okay in the future. That's what we've done uh, in the first part of the semester. Now, the second one, really instead of focusing on the eat-in prediction, basically tries to model the problem of text correction as that of generating correct sentences. It's going to learn a model of language, how to write good sentences, and it's going to use this to estimate, so I'm going to learn a probability distribution over all sentences. Of course, in practice, we're going to make some assumptions because what kind of probability distribution are we going to learn to represent all sentences. We're going to make some assumptions on that. But once we have made this assumption, we're going to use this to estimate which sentence is more likely. So is the probability under this model that I've learned of I saw the girl eat the park is smaller or larger than I saw the girl in the park? And hopefully, if we learn a good language model, we'll decide that this one has higher probability. But notice that once we've learned this model, we can actually make a lot of decision relative to it. Not necessarily just the eat-in decision. We can make a lot of others. On the other hand, we probably learn something that is a little bit heavier, um, in general at least, than just the eat-in rule. So again, in practice, the decision policy is going to depend on assumptions. Uh, and the assumption, the guarantees uh, are are going to depend on, we have to assume the right probability distribution. I put right in quotes because we never know exactly what it is, but we'll have to make assumptions on some family of probability distribution that is expressive enough, but not too expressive, to express the model that we care about. Uh, at the end, uh, the generating paradigm really approximates a probability distribution over x cross y, not just a decision function. Uh, and given this probability distribution, we can make decisions. Make decisions by looking at these comparisons, essentially. So that's the, the gist of what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about this paradigm and, and be a little bit more specific. Um, we call this generative because we also care about X here. Right? Part of the knowledge uh, in the model is how is data generated. For example, in this case, how are sentences generated and what is the probability of a given sentence, which is something that we omit from the discriminative problem, uh, model that we discussed earlier. Okay, so uh, before we get to it, I want to make one comment that sometimes is confusing in the literature. Uh, there are really two different notions when we talk about probabilistic learning. One notion is we want to learn functions that can be viewed as probability distribution. For example, learn a concept or a function that is C from X to 0, 1, the interval 0 to 1, where we can interpret C of X as the probability that the label 1 is assigned to X. So it's basically a real valued function that we're learning. Uh, now, the learning theory that we covered at the beginning of the semester covers this, right? All the functions, or almost all the functions that we learned actually return a number between 0 and 1. And we talked a little bit, and we'll talk some more about the fact that these can be made or can be converted to behave like a probability distribution. So I can assume when you give me a number between 0 and 1, which is the output of your perceptron, say, I can assume that it does represent the probability that the label is 1. Now, really all of learning theory that we've done applies with a few extensions. For example, when we talked about VC theory, we assume that we have Boolean functions, not real-valued functions, not even multi-valued discrete functions. But everything can be extended, in fact, to these 
uh, scenario. So learning theory actually applies to this. On the other hand, the second concept is Bayesian learning, where we don't use the standard learning theory from before, but rather we use a probabilistic criterion as a way to decide which hypothesis we're going to choose and work with. Uh, the, the hypothesis itself could be deterministic, could be a Boolean function, could be a conjunction, right? So it doesn't matter what is the function. So really the difference here is not in the hypothesis that we learn, but rather the process that we use in order to learn it. In both cases, we can learn the same things. Okay, so now that we have uh, clarified this, le let's start talking about Bayesian learning. Questions so far? Okay, so, uh, so our goal is to find the best hypothesis, H, uh, from some space, capital H, given that we observe data, D. In fact, very similar to, what, to the goal that we had before. Uh, here we're going to define best to be the most probable hypothesis. Now, in order to do that, in order to talk about the most probable hypothesis, we need some distributions. So, so I need to have some probability distribution defined over the class H. We did not have that before, right? Over all hypotheses that we consider. In addition, in order to choose, we'll have to make some assumptions about the relation between the data and the hypothesis. So assume that I look at this hypothesis, what kind of data can be observed and what cannot. Uh, so, uh, as we'll see, basically we're going to use Bayes' rule, a very simple probabilistic uh, rule in order to do it, but we can be Bayesian about other things, not necessarily only about uh, which hypothesis to choose, specifically about how we estimate parameters and, and a few other things. So here are the basics that we have. So really these four components is the old theory um, and the rest is just details. Um, so we assume P of H, we denote by P of H the prior probability of the hypothesis H. So this really is our background knowledge, right? It reflects what we know before we've seen any data. If we don't have any information, we assume uniform distribution of all the H's. P of D is the probability of the data, this sample of the data. Again, no knowledge of the hypothesis in this case, just the probability of observing this sample. P of D given H is the posterior, uh, the, the probability of observing the sample given that this is the hypothesis. This is the relation that I alluded to between the hypothesis and the data. Given this hypothesis, What's the probability of observing this data? Given another hypothesis, the probability is different to observe the data. And finally, what we really care about is the posterior probability of H. Given that we observe this data, what's the probability that this is uh, the, uh, the hypothesis uh, that we care about? So these are the four components. And every, what puts them together is this very simple Bayes theorem that you've all seen before uh, in many ways. Basically, it says the posterior, the probability of H given D, is P of D given H times P of H divided by P of D. So this is just product rule, just rewriting the product rule. You've all seen it many times. And just written this way with D at H, I want to make sure that you that it makes sense to you. And to make, to, to make sure that it makes sense, notice that as you expect, P of H given D goes up with P of H. Right? So if P of H, just the prior is higher, P of H given D is going to be higher. Makes sense, right? And of course it goes up with P of D given H. If the data is more likely given this hypothesis, the hypothesis is more likely. And it also goes down with P of D. Why does it make sense that it goes down with P of D? Uh, we have more hypotheses, but, but here 
I don't involve the hypothesis. I'm just saying that P of D goes up. Why should P of H given D go down? Or let's, th that's the right direction, or let's think about D as the whole data. If this data is very probable, I don't care about H. The probability of D is, is large. It doesn't give me any preference between H's, right? So, uh, and you can see this uh, from, from the, again, also from the product rule. Okay, so this is just a reminder, I mean, Again, I'm assuming that you all know this. We gave you a problem set, zero, and another one in five to refresh your uh, uh, understanding of probability. So just to bring everything to, your, uh, to the top of your head. I'm just listing here some of the key formulas, you know, product rules, uh, independence, sum rule, Base rule, this is the same base rule, only that I replaced H and D by A and B. Total probability uh, formula and total conditional probability formula. Again, all things that you've seen, just make sure that you, uh, you understand this. Okay, so, so now that we have base rule, what is the learning scenario that we have? What, what is the... Uh, so the... As a learner, we're going to consider a set of hypoth candidate hypotheses. Sometimes we're going to call them models, as before. And we want to find the most probable one, given the observed data. We're going to call this maxim maximally probable hypothesis the MAP hypothesis. And Bayes' theorem is used to compute it in the following way. So H map is the arg max over all capital H. Of P, of P of H given D. I'm using Bayes' rule, so it's arg max of P of D given H times P of H divided by P of D, and it's arg max of P of D given H, P of H. So I drop the denominator. Why is it okay to drop the denominator? It's the same for all fractions that I'm comparing here, right? H doesn't depend on it, so I can drop it. So, so that's basically it. So, so that's all there is uh, to Bayesian learning, right? So we're done, basically, right? So every time, that's what you're going to do. You're going to look at H, uh, assume some prior P of H, figure out how to compute P of D given H, what is the probability under the assumption that you're making? What's the probability of this data or this sample of data given H? And that's it. And do this argmax. Really, we're done. The only, the only issue now is to do this for different cases, different probability, probabilistic assumptions, different H's, uh, and also being Bayesian or using this for different things. You can use this for functions. You can use this just for points, for predictions on specific points. And you can do this on parameters. But it's all the same thing, right? So really, this says everything that we need to know. The rest, the next two lectures, are going to be examples of how to use this. Before that, let me just w uh, introduce one other notation. Quite often, uh, we don't have any priors or we assume that a priori all the hypotheses are equally probable. P of H i is equal to P of H j for all i and j. In this case, the maximum likelihood hypothesis is the map. The map hypothesis becomes the maximum likelihood hypothesis, which is just argmax over all h's of P of d given h. Right? So I also drop this component, P of H, from this because it's the same for all. Um, okay, so essentially you can think about it, look for the hypothesis that best explains the data, right? P of D given H is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. We're looking for the one that best explains the data. Okay, 
Let's start with some examples. So here is the simplest example we can come up with. Uh, fair, uh, you have uh, two coins. Uh, either a fair coin, probability of head is 0.5, probability of tail is 0.5, or an unfair coin, a biased coin, that the probability of head is 0.6. Okay? We want to decide which is which. I give you these two coins, which is which. This is our learning problem. Okay? doesn't feel maybe like a learning problem, but it is a learning problem. What you're going to do is you're going to generate your own data by tossing these coins and define D. Once you define D and observe it, you're going to decide what's the bias of the coin. Okay? And again, very simple. Uh, I'm sure you, you've seen something like this. My two hypotheses are H1, P of H is 0.5, H2, P of H, 0.6, right? That's, that's how I distinguish the hypothesis. Now I have to, to follow the Bayes uh, rule. I'm going to assume a prior. Okay? Let's assume that my prior is H1 uh, is 0.75, H2 is 0.25. So I think that the coin is biased. It's, it's fair, sorry. Right? H1 as 0.75. And now I do an experiment. I toss a coin. First experiment, I got H. Now let's see what happens. What does Bayes' rule tell us? Uh, I have to compute P of D given H. We know that because we have an assumption. What is our assumption on the model? What is P of D given H? This is where I didn't explicitly write the assumption, but we have some probabilistic assumption that we're making here. What is the assumption? Independence, but now I have just one toss, so it doesn't come into play yet. What, what is P of D given H? I'm assuming something about the probability distribution. I'm going to assume Bernoulli here, right? I could have assumed something else. So what is, I'm assuming that P of D given H is 0.5. P of D given H2 is 0.6, just the bias of the coin. This is an assumption. Once I have this, I can compute also the probability of the data. Now, you know that I don't need to know the probability of the data if you look at Bayes' rule. But just for the exercise, let's compute the probability of the data. I can use the total probability formula. The probability of the data is... P of D given H1 times P of H1 plus P of D given H2 times P of H2. And P of D given H1 is 0.5. And the prior of H1 is 0.75. P of D given H2 is 0.6. And the prior is 0.25. That's the probability of the data. So the, it's likely that I'll see this data that I'll see head. That's what it says, right? It's greater than 0.5 to see heads. Uh, and now the posterior, using Bayes' rule, uh, P of H1 given D is P of D given H1, P of H1 divided by P of D, 0.714. And I have to do it for H2. Same thing. 0.286. So I'm thinking now, I have to do arg max over this. I'm thinking now that H1 is more likely, but it's not as likely as my priors. Right? So my priors were 0 0.75, 0 0.25. Now I observed something, and I'm less confident that the, that the coin is, is fair. That's what it is. That's what happens. Okay, now notice that you could have done the same thing without computing P of D. You will get just the product of these two numbers and these two numbers <coughs> and compare them. The only thing is that it will not be probabilities. It will still give you the H, the correct H, but this will not be probabilities. You'll have to normalize them. Okay, now you can go through the exercise uh, and given that now we still think that the coin is more likely to be fair. You can go through the exercise 
and um, try a few things. For example, you can try the maximum likelihood approach. In the maximum likelihood approach, I don't have a prior. My prior for biased or fair is 0.5. In this case, if I toss a head, which I did in the first time, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to assume now, or my learning is going to result in thinking that it's the after a head, if I'm doing the maximum likelihood, it's probably the biased. Because I got head and it's biased toward head, that's probably the right one. You can do the math. You can do another exercise, try 100 coin tosses. Let's assume that you got 70 heads and see what happens. Again, it's a very easy exercise. Uh, the answer is in the next slide, uh, but you can actually try it and, and just understand that um, what's happening here. So I'm not going to go into these details. But clearly, you will assume, because I told you that you got 70 heads, that the bias coin is a lot more likely, really a lot more likely than the fair coin. Okay, questions? Okay, so that's exercise one. Let's, let's uh, go back and think a little bit about what we did in the previous semester. I'm going to spend a minute now trying to think about learning a concept, which we've done previously, from the Bayesian perspective. So, so the exercise here is going to be the following exercise. Assume that we are given a concept class C. Uh, we're given a collection of examples. Uh, for F in C, we're going to try to identify H that is consistent with F on the training data, right? We know that this is the right thing to do. It's going to do well in the future. And before we, we run learning algorithms and show the hypothesis and so on, I want to see what does Bayes' theory says about this protocol. Uh, so to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, I'm going to write now all the components of Bayes' theory. Uh, the way I think about it is I'm thinking about uh, the probabilities that I'm going to write here as the probability distribution over a fixed set, a set of M examples. I'm not going to think about each example separately. Here is a sample. Let's think about the probability of this. This is going to simplify things. So, okay. So P of H. P of H is uniform. I don't have any preference. So P of H, P of lowercase h, is 1 over the size of h. Okay? P of D, given h. I'm assuming that, P of, that an example XL is observed, and the whole data is going to be M like this. What's going to be P of D given h? Here is how I, I want to think about it. So P of the collection of M examples given H is either 1 or 0. It's 1 if H is consistent with the data, right? So for all X, H of X is L. And it's 0 otherwise, right? So if I have a consistent hypothesis, I cannot see even one sample that disagrees with it. If I have an inconsistent hypothesis, uh, or if I see, if I have a consistent hypothesis and uh, this is not consistent, I'll never see it. That's basically what it says. Right? Everyone agrees? This is just another way of saying uh, I have a consistent hypothesis. What is the probability of the data? Again, I'm going to uh, use the total probability formula. P of D is P of D given HI times P of HI. I'm summing over HI. So what do I have here? P of HI is 1 over H in all cases, 1 over size of H. What is this? This is, as we said here, it's 1 for those HI that are consistent with the data. And it's zero for those HI that are not consistent with the data. 
right? P of D given H could be either 0 or 1. If you're consistent, it's 1. If you're inconsistent, it's 0. You'll never see this data. So basically what this does is count how many hypotheses are consistent. So I can write it as H consistent over H, the number of consistent hypotheses divided by the number of all hypotheses. Uh, I have one more component, the key one, P of H given D, the posterior. So I'm going to use Bayes' rule, and I argue that this is what I'm going to get. P of H given D, Bayes' rule says P of D given H, P of H divided by P of D. P of H, if you remember, was 1 over H. P of D was the size of H in the denominator, so they cancel, right? And I'm going to get in the denominator 1 over the size of H consistent from this ratio. And this tells me it's either 1 or 0. So it's either 1 times this if I'm consistent or 0 if I'm not consistent. So what did I get? Hopefully you're not surprised. This is what you wanted to get. What we get is that if you just use Bayes' rule without any other assumptions, no priors, any, nothing, in the setting that we had previously, uh, the probability of the hypothesis is going to be zero if it's inconsistent. And all the consistent ones are fair game. They are all equally good from my perspective. Right? That's what we did before. We just said, choose a consistent hypothesis. We couldn't tell you which one to choose. And that's what it says. So this is just, just kind of a game with notations to make sure that we understand the rules. Let's move to real examples, almost real examples. Okay, so, so then my next example is going to be the following uh, simple example. I'm going to assume some model of language. Yes? I could, right? So that, that actually is a very good point. So I could, instead of saying this, I'm going to say something, you know, I prefer short hypothesis. So this is where issues like Kolmogorov complexity and stuff like this comes in. Uh, or, or minimum description lengths, these kind of ideas, where you prefer hypotheses uh, that are, uh, have some properties. For example, shorter. Yeah, it will be a little bit more complicated to write this than one slide. But yes, in principle, then I will have preference among these consistent hypotheses. It will not be uniform. Yeah. And in fact, there is a theory that does stuff like this. I actually commented on this uh, at the end of Peck learning. Peck Bayesian theory is essentially refining it in similar ways. So it's the Peck theory, only that it uh, incorporates idea from Bayes theory uh, by incorporating priors and essentially refining the, all the generalization bounds that we've shown in Peck theory by incorporating uh, priors over uh, hypotheses. But my goal here was really just kind of syntactic to, to get you to understand this. And now let's do it in another example. So I'm going to assume a very, very simple model of language. I'm going to have only five characters and a space. So all my sentences are going to have A, B, C, D, E, and a space. And I'm also going to assume a very, very simple way uh, to generate sentences in this language, right? So I'm going to basically assume, for example, this is just an example, after I solve the learning problem, these are the probabilities, P1 for A, P2 for B, and so on, and the sum of this is 1, okay? Uh, how do I generate um, sentences? I'm going to assume independent characters. So every time I'm generating a character with these probabilities until I reach a space 
I'm done. So a sentence, which is x1 up to xk, I can always write it using the product probability. I can decompose this as p of x1 given the rest because I'm assuming independent it's going to be just the product of p of x i's uh, and these are uh, my parameters of the model so now because I gave you already the p of x i's uh, given a sentence you can compute the probability of this sentence uh, these character generation probabilities sometimes are called unigram probability or character unigram probabilities. Our goal is once you have this model, for example, these parameters, to determine which of these two strings, given two strings, is more likely. Uh, so, for example, I give you these two strings. You can compute, I gave you the parameters of the model you can compute the probability of each one of them. Which one of them is going to be more likely? The first one. Why the first one? Yeah, so four of the five characters are the same. Two A's, two B's. And here you have a C versus another B here, but P of C is greater than P of B. So we know what's more likely. Now the question here is, what's, how, what's the learning problem, right? So the decision problem is very easy. The learning is learning the parameters, right? How to figure out that P of A is 0.3, P of B is 0.1, and so on. And the question is going to be, how do we learn this? Suggestions? I told you that everything is generated independently. I could give you a lot of strings in the language. How would you estimate P of A? Yeah? Okay. Suggestion, take the count of A's, how many times you've seen A in your data, divided by the total number of characters, including spaces, uh, and that's going to give you P of A. People agree with that? Okay, so that makes an assumption, right? And, and uh, we will think about what kind of assumption this makes uh, in a slightly more general way here. So here is a general setting. I, I argue it's the same problem that I ask, the same question I asked before. You toss a coin, the coin is P1 minus P coin, that is P for head 1 minus P for tail. I toss it M times and I get K heads and M minus K heads. What's P? So a suggestion here is that P is K over M. Why? I think it's a quarter. Well, why is your solution better than my solution? Okay, so, so the suggestion here is that K over M is a hypothesis, and this hypothesis is more likely than quarter to explain this data, that I, I tossed the coin m times and I got k. So, so basically, that's the game we're playing today, right? We're doing maximum likelihood or map assumption. We're going to do maximum likelihood today. So, so let's just derive it. Before, we had a very simple uh, case. We had two coins, and I can compute p of h1, p of h2, and compare them. Now I have infinitely many hypotheses, so I have to derive a simple method to figure out which of the infinitely many wins the argmax. And luckily we have something that we call calculus, so we know how to do this. So 
if P is the probability of head, the probability of the data observed is P of D given P is this. P to the K, 1 minus P to the M minus K. Everyone agrees? Again, it's an assumption. I assume the specific probability model, Bernoulli, and I followed up. Uh, the log likelihood of this, it's typically easy to take log of this if we want to do some optimization with this, is K log P plus M minus K log 1 minus P. And I want to maximize this log probability. Maximizing the likelihood is equivalent to maximizing the log likelihood. And therefore, uh, I'm taking the log and maximizing. So the derivative with respect to P is K over P. I'm taking this, right? Derivative with respect to P is K over P minus M minus K over 1 minus P. If you want this to be uh, an extreme point equal to 0, you get P equal K over M. So you were right. That's the best value that we can come up with. Now again, this makes an assumption. You will see in a problem set in the next one, the same kind of problem with slightly different assumptions. Actually, the answer is going to be different because I'm going to assume a different probabilistic model that governs the tosses. Okay? And you can imagine something like this yourself. Think about it. What kind of models that govern the tosses or the observation of head or tail uh, will actually give you different results, different ways to estimate the parameters and consequently different parameters. Okay, so, okay, Th basically that's what I said. You could assume a different model uh, and we will see several models uh, for data generation now, another thing that we haven't talked about is, is smoothing. If you only observed three tosses and all of them were head, do you want to say that the probability of tail is zero? Probably not. And similarly, if the, you'll, uh, so, so in practice we want to be able to not just do the counting, but rather smooth things away from zero. Uh, and we'll talk about several ways uh, of doing it. Uh, this can be viewed either as a hack, uh, and it can be viewed by assuming specific priors on the parameters when we estimate parameters, and actually being Bayesian also about the estimation itself. Uh, and both of them actually give you the same results, luckily. Uh, okay, so, so just, uh, again, background. You've seen this before. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to introduce four probability distributions because I want to use them in the next models uh, that we're talking about. So, so far we talked about this Bernoulli distribution, right? We assume that we have a, a random binary variable with probability P of X being 1 is P, and P of X being 0, 1 minus P. Uh, we can also assume a binomial distribution, which actually is uh, a close relative of the Bernoulli distribution. In this case, a random variable takes one of N values, and we can think about it as the number of successes in N Bernoulli trials. Okay? So the probability of this random variable x taking the value k, which I denote here as f n p k, is n choose k, p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k, right? So n choose k is the number of, the, the, k, the number of ways to choose these k trials out of the n in which I'm going to see toss equal 1, and then times p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. Uh, and, and really, you can think about this as x is the sum of y's, where y is my Bernoulli's, and x is the binomial np. Okay, two other probability distributions that you may or may not have seen uh, that also are close relatives. Categorical distribution, a random variable takes values 1 to k, it takes the value 
i with probability pi, where the sum of the pi's is uh, 1. Okay? Generalizing the, the Bernoulli, if you want. And the multinomial is, again, a close relative. In fact, the multinomial to the categorical is what binomial is to Bernoulli. So it's a sum of categorical variables. Uh, Xi will take K, one of k values, and it indicates the number of times I was observed when I did n categorical trials. So I'm recording the outcome of these k experiments in this vector. The vector x is x1 up to xk that gives me uh, the outcomes of my categorical trials. Uh, so it follows the multinomial distribution NP, where P is a vector of k numbers that sum to 1. And the probability of observing these k outcomes, given N and P, is this. The multinomial coefficient, N factorials over Xi factorials product, P1 to the number of successes here, up to PK to the number of successes here. Okay, again, you've all seen this, uh, and, and importantly, the sum of the X, I, Z. Why is this important? Because sometimes we want to uh, devise or think about phenomena that we see as generated according to one of these probability distributions. So we've already seen a toss coin, very simple, and we assume the Bernoulli. Now we're going to see something a little bit more interesting, we're going to assume, uh, we're going to talk about documents. So here is one way to think about classifying documents. So I'm giving a collection of documents. They are all written in a very simple language, ABC, three different words, that's it. Uh, all the documents, I'm going to assume, have exactly N words. They are all A, B, or C. And we are given a labeled collection. So for each document in the M documents, I'm going to get a label that is either good or bad. Either this is a good document or a bad document. Okay? Eventually, my learning problem is going to be given a document, predict whether it's good or bad. Okay? And my assumption here is that somehow the words chosen into the document are an indication of where it's good, whether it's good or bad, right? I want just now to place it in a probabilistic setting. So how can I think about it through my Bayesian learning uh, a approach, okay? So how do I think about it? I need to imagine what is the probabilistic process that generated the data. I'm going to assume some probability distribution in doing that. Then I'm going to observe a lot of examples. These are given to me here, M examples with labels. Use these examples to estimate the parameters, the most likely parameters, just like you estimated the most likely parameter of the coin. And then once I have this, I can make predictions. I can look at a document and tell you whether it's good or bad. Okay, is the process clear? Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to assume that the model uses the multinomial distribution, that is, A, I, B, I, C, I, is the number of times I've seen a word in a document, D, I, which means the sum of these is N. All the documents have the same length. And, and I'm assuming the following generative model. I'm assuming that the probability of D, I, in a good document is multinomial coefficients, n factorial divided by ai factorial, bi factorial, ci factorial, times this, alpha i, alpha 1 to the ai, ai is the number of times I've seen a, beta 1 to the bi, the number of times I've seen b, gamma 1 to the ci, the number of times I've seen c. So these are my parameters, right? So alpha 1, beta 1, gamma 1, are the probability that A, B, and C respectively appear in a good document. Okay, that's my model. So I have three parameters. 
that determine what's the probability of A, B, and C appearing in a good document. Now I need to do the same thing for a bad document, right? So I'm going to assume P of DI given a bad document is same coefficient with these parameters, alpha zero to the AI, beta zero to the BI, gamma zero to the CI. Where, again, the alpha I, the, be, the, the alpha zero, beta zero, gamma zero are the probabilities that A, B, and C respectively appear in a bad document. Okay, so, so far it's an assumption, right? I don't know these numbers. I'm just assuming that that's the probability. So that's the model that the multinomial is the model that governs the generation of documents. And these parameters are the specific parameters of the multinomial distribution. Now that I've done this, oh, and of course, I need to assume that the sum of each triple here is one, right? Because I generate a word every time. Uh, so, the game here is, is the following game. Uh, we made an assumption on how the data was generated, right? So, multinomial with these alpha, beta, and gamma, three, uh, three parameters for each case, the good case and the bad case. Now, I'm going to observe documents. From these documents, I'm going to estimate these six parameters. Once I have this, I can look at a document, count the number of A's, B's, and C's, compute P of D given 1, compute P of D given 0, and see which one is larger. Do the arg max. Okay? So let's just take one more step here in the estimation. Um, so the classification problem is going to be this, right? So this is just copying what we had before about the process, to determine if it's good or bad, I'm going to compute the probability of y given d, which is Bayes' rule. If I have uh, any prior p of y, I'll put it here. If I don't have any prior, really what I care about is p of d given y, right? just maximum likelihood. But either way, the question for me is going to be now uh, we need to know the parameters of the model in order to compute it. Okay? So, again, as I said, we just do Bayes' rule. There's nothing uh, more than that. The only question is, is how to do it. In this case, how to estimate the parameters. So I'm going to derive the most likely value of the parameters by maximizing the log likelihood of observed data, right? So that's what we're going to do. Here is the data. In order to figure out what are the parameters, we're going to maximize the likelihood of the data and use it to derive the parameters. So the probability of the data is the product over all the data I've seen, P of Y comma D, which I can write as product over all I, P of D given Y, P of Y. Uh, I have data, label data, so not a big deal. I can write down. Now, I'm going to use the following notation. The P of Y I'm going to call eta. This is the probability that the example is, oh, I should have, uh, oh, I should have written here P of Y being 1, I'm going to call eta. This is the probability that an example is good. So here is how I write it. Notice that I have to write for a given example here, this is one example. What is the probability of this example? But I don't know if this example is positive or negative. So I don't know which parameters to use. Should I use the alpha 0, beta 0, gamma 0? Or should I use the alpha 1, beta 1, gamma 1? That's, that's a diff an algebraic difficulty, right? I don't know how to write it. I want to write it in a closed form. So here is how I'm going to write it. I'm writing, the, this is the coefficient. This is the one case, the good case. And I'm going to do this to the power of y1 times 1 minus eta, the same thing with the alpha 0, beta 0, gamma 0 to the power 1 minus y1. What does this give me? If it so happened that the label is 1, this guy survives. I'm just writing this, right? It's to the power 1. 
and this guy disappears because it's to the power of 1 minus 1, 0, this actually uh, disappears and becomes 1, the number 1. On the other hand, if it's a negative example, y0, this part survives, and this part disappears because it's to the power 0. So in one time, I've written both components. And I had to do it, I had to do something here if I don't want a condition, but rather write one algebraic expression. Okay? So this is a really important trick that you will see a couple more times on how to write an expression without knowing what the label is. Writing in a general way, right? So it's not the only way to do it, but it's a good way to do it, and we're going to do it uh, a couple more times. Okay, now that I have this closed form expression, for the likelihood, uh, I want to maximize it. So you know how to maximize likelihood. We've done this before. First of all, I'm going to take the log, because it makes things easier. When I take the log, these exponents are going to move to be product, so it's y i times something, and the something is the l l sum of logs with the a i, b i, c i that were here in the exponent becoming the coefficients, and the same thing here with 1 minus y i. Okay? And now I have to find parameters. What are the parameters that I have here? I have these alphas, betas, gammas, six parameters, and I have this eta, right? What's the probability that it's positive or negative? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do this, the, the easy case. I'm going to compute the eta. In order to compute the eta, I'm going to differentiate relative to the eta. Notice that what happens is that everything here disappears. So what I'm going to get is yi over eta, the def derivative of log, so I got this, minus, because of this guy, this guy, 1 minus yi over 1 minus eta. That's the derivative, sum over i. If I equate this to 0, what you get is that eta is the sum over all i's of yi over m. Is that what you expected? Why? What's the semantics of this? Yeah? Yeah. So it makes sense, right? The probability of, of y being 1 is count the number of 1 examples and divide by the number of total examples. So, so that makes sense. We, we did the math right. Now, you want to do the same thing for the alphas. You can actually do it, but it's actually a little bit subtle because uh, there is a constraint here. You c the sum of the alpha, the zero parameters, and the sum of the one parameters is one. And you have to take this into account when you do it. So there is some... Uh, Subtlety in doing it, I'm not going to do it now, but uh, you will do it in a problem set. So it's, it's a, or something similar to this, you'll do in a problem set. Uh, questions on this? So basically, what we do is an extension of the coin tossing case, somewhat more sophisticated model, but really the same principle. Okay. Uh, I can give a few other examples. I'm not going to go into all the details uh, today, but here is one quick example. This is a somewhat more sophisticated language model. Again, I'm going to have just five characters, but here I'm going to assume that in addition to the five characters, A, B, C, D, E, I also have states. And the states are such that I'm in a state and I'm generating a character. And then I'm moving to another state, I'm generating a character. Moving to another state, generating a character, and so on. So you can think about this diagram in, this in the following diagram. So I'm st I, when I'm in state B, I'm producing a character with probability P of X given B, where X could be A, B, C, D, or E. And then I'm moving to another state. With some probability, I'm going to move to the state I. With some probability, I'm going to go back to the state B. 
and then I produce another state, and move again, and produce another character, and so on. So you can think about this as this sequential process. I'm starting somewhere. With probability 0.5, I'm going to start in B. With probability 0.5, I'm going to start in I. Here I started in B. I produce a character. The probability of producing a character is written here. P of A given that I'm in B, P of B given that I'm in B, P of C given that I'm in B, and so on. Five probabilities. And the same thing given that I'm in I. So if I, after I produce, I move to another state. I move to I. I'm producing something. I move again, state in I, producing something, and so on. So this is a Markov model. If I don't know the I's and the B's, I just see this part of the sequence. We call it a hidden Markov model, hence HMM. And it's the same game. The question is going to be, how do I estimate the parameters of the model? And here there's going to be two options. Either you will just give me this sequence, and I'll have to estimate the parameters of the model. It's going to be a hard problem because I don't know which state produced each character. Or you'll give me both this and the state sequence. It's going to be an easier problem. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But, but from your perspective now, the important thing is to realize that it's the same problem we solved before. You just have to write the likelihood of the observation, maximize it, and find the parameters uh, that correspond to it. Okay, so there's a little bit more details here. I'm going to stop here. Next time we're going to go to more algorithmic perspective. I want to give you these uh, feedback forms. Please, there are two pages. It's not going to take you a lot of time. Uh, but I want to basically feedback for us on, uh, on the class. So please send this up. Send this up. And you will collect it? Yeah, I can collect it. I can also help. OK, I'll just give it. Uh, send this up.